Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Keegan from AMP Capital. I'm going to speak very briefly. This I imagine is going to be an incredibly exciting session, hearing about disruption. Tony Sieber has been on a plane from Oslo. He's with us briefly in Sydney before he heads off to Boulder, Colorado, then off to Brussels as he tells the tale of disruption around the world. This session is going to last for about 45 minutes and then there'll be some short time for Q&A. The sponsor of the event is Norton Rose Fulbright and I'd like to welcome Simon Curry, the Global Head of Energy, to introduce Tony. Um, so this in front of you is a glimpse into my mind, uh, which is quite scary for most people. Um, this was formed in many parts because of when I started reading Tony's books. Uh, and there's a whole thing around the edge of the possible, and this is the way, you know, this is the way we now look at our business. And while you know, I'm obsessed to be a lawyer, I'm much more interesting when I talk about things like this. Uh, and yeah, there's various things on here which are directly relevant to what uh, Tony will talk about. Um, we talk about things like the Terawatt Initiative, which is all about solar getting to zero, at the same time as mobilising the trillions, and we happen to sit on trillions in Australia, into the solar industry. So you're as happy to invest in Malawi as you are in the US, because effectively there's financial products sitting behind that, which effectively encourage you to effectively just follow the sun. Um, I also talk a lot about um, uh, the hydrogen economy and what that is going to do to us in terms of something we used to think we were going to crack from coal, but we now look at green hydrogen and again as the Saudi Arabia of solar, what we can potentially do when you've got 24 million people, abundant land, and as a Kiwi, you sit here going that most of the stuff you do here, that's not farming in the way I look at it. That's an intergenerational burden in many cases, and we have to work out how we can use that land better with different tools in the future. A few years ago, you'd have all laughed at me about this sort of discussion, but that's where we're heading now. So I'll um, get out of the way um, and let you um, hear from Tony, um, and you can see why I told all of my team around the world they just had to read his books. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you, Simon, for that introduction, and thanks you all for being here. Um, click. So I want to take you into the future, and I want to tell you about the edge of disruptions. Um, but before I do that, I want to take you into the past. We used horses as humanity for thousands of years. Uh, this is New York City, 1900, Fifth Avenue. Can anyone see the one car in that picture? Uh, all horses except one car. There it is, one car. 13 years later, can anyone see the horse in that picture? 13 years, that's all it took from all horse to all car. Uh, there's the one horse, it doesn't even look like a horse. Um, this is a disruption. This is what's called the technology disruption. And what is a disruption? It's when um, new products and services do two things. One is to create a new market and two, either destroy or radically transform existing industries. And I'll take you to 1985, um, when the then largest telecom company on earth, AT&T, hired consulting company McKinsey, and they asked them one question. One question. Um, in 15 years, how many subscribers will this thing called cell phone have in 15 years? Just give me one number. So McKinsey went off and did whatever it is they do, and they came back with their number, 900,000 in 15 years. The real number was 109 million. This is not a small mistake. Uh, <laughs> this is a factor of 120x. And of course, AT&T landline got disrupted. But not just that. They missed out on the largest uh, wealth creation opportunity, legal, uh, of the 21st century. Uh, if you just look at the top five internet uh, mobile companies, Apple and Google and Amazon and Facebook and so on, that's two trillion US dollars in market uh, valuation, just the five top companies. And those are the opportunities that you miss out on when you miss out on technology disruptions. And it's usually smart people. It's usually the experts and the insiders 
who will dismiss disruptive opportunities. They'll say, nah, can't possibly happen, or not this quickly. Or, it can't possibly happen this quickly. Um, and so this, my work, is disruption. Um, and it's also to answer this question. Why do smart people in smart organizations consistently fail to anticipate, let alone lead, market disruptions? So I have, over the last few years, created a new framework that not only can explain disruptions uh, you know, in the past, which is not that hard, but can hopefully predict uh, and anticipate disruptions. So I'll walk you through this a little bit, and then I'll show you the disruption of transportation. So um, the first model is disruption from below. And this is the traditional um, uh, form of disruption where you start out with a product that is inferior relative to the mainstream market, uh, but because it improves at a faster rate than the market, it pierces and disrupts the market from below. So solar energy, personal computers, the web, web publishing. So if you look at newspaper publishing, revenues were going up and up and up and up, and even after the web, even after Netscape and, and browsers and so on, record revenues kept increasing. So what did experts say? Eh, the web, who cares? Nobody will ever read the newspaper online. I mean, can you believe now that that's what the experts were saying? Really smart people. Um, and of course, that, this is what happened. Boom. Okay, when disruptions happen, they happen in an instant. Um, and essentially, the newspaper industry still hasn't hit rock bottom. Um, disruption from above. This is what essentially the smartphone is, which was not explained before. Uh, when the iPhone came out in 2007 in the Android, folks were saying, who would ever buy a $600 phone when you can buy the $100 Nokia? Remember Nokia? Gone, right? Um, this is a disruption from above. This is when you have a superior product, but also more expensive. Now, what the experts miss is that this is not usually a one-to-one -one substitution. They miss that. And the iPhone is not just a phone. We can make phone calls, but that's one of the many things that we can do with the iPhone. Same thing with the electric vehicle, right? When you ask the, the experts, they look at you know, the EV versus the internal combustion engine automobile as a one-to-one -one substitute, and it's not, because you can do a lot of things with the electric vehicle. Uh, and I'll explain that. But even if all you do, uh, the EV starts out as more expensive product, but if you take the technology cost curve, you can essentially anticipate when it's going to pierce the market from above. And it's going to essentially uh, disrupt the uh, gasoline, the petrol vehicle, from above. But that's not really what's going to happen because of this Big Bang disruption. And I'll come back to Big Bang later, but Big Bang disruption is when um, products come out and on day one, they are cheaper, faster, better, more convenient, and more customizable. On day one. So the incumbents have no chance, no chance, period, right? And so one example is Google Maps with uh, Driving Direction API. The day that it came out versus Garmin, remember Garmin, TomTom, Tom? gone, right? And this is when the day, to the day that uh, Google came out with Maps, look at the stock price. It went down 80% plus within weeks. They had no chance, right? This is a big bang disruption. So here's a question. Why, how can new products be faster, cheaper, better, more customizable, more convenient on day one? Okay, and can you anticipate that if you're an incumbent? Um, so one of the th uh, things we have to look at is technologies. And technologies have cost curves. Essentially, uh, how quickly do they improve on the same dollar basis? And so Moore's law is the best known cost curve, which means um, on the same dollar basis, it says that uh, computing improves by about 2x every two years. So it improves at about 41% per year. 
So essentially, 41% improvement means over 20 years, it improves by a thousand times. So your smartphone, $600, is the equivalent of a $600,000 computer just 20 years ago, or $600 million computer 40 years ago, $600 billion computer 60 years ago, right? So that kind of improvement is what has made Silicon Valley what it is. Um, but it's not just Moore's Law. Every single technology has a cost curve. Digital imaging and uh, network capacity and lithium-ion batteries and so on. And it's not that these technologies are disruptive, but it's when you combine them. And this is what I call technology convergence. It's the convergence of technologies that make possible new business models and new products. So we need to look at technology convergence, not single technologies, because that's what makes new products possible. And so the iPhone and the Android both came out 10 years ago in 2007, both of them. Was that a coincidence? It wasn't, because that was the year when all the technologies that made the smartphone possible came out. And it just so happened that Google and Apple were the ones who put it together. It could have been somebody else, it could have been Motorola, but they didn't do it, right? So those technologies converged 2007. Um, the other thing we need to know about technology disruptions and technology adoption is that they happen as S-curves. So this is you know, one example. Um, we need to know what the tipping point is gonna be. It may take a while, weeks, years, decades, before we hit the tipping point, but when it tips, essentially it grows exponentially, and it's over. I mean, the incumbents are over, over you know, a few years or a few weeks or whatever, right? S-curves. But mainstream analysts will give you, you know, straight lines. They'll say that the future is just like the past, plus or minus 10% per year. It doesn't happen that way. You know, when disruptions happen, they happen very quickly. So um, not only that, but the S-curves are accelerating. If you look at the S-curves of different technologies from the 1900s to the, you know, to the last few years, they're getting steeper and steeper and steeper. That mean, that this means that it's happening much more quickly. Disruptions are happening much more quickly because technologies are being adopted much more quickly, okay? Um, if anything, I mean, they're not linear at all. So what am I looking at? What kind of technologies am I following that I think that when they converge in different ways are going to disrupt different industries? Because make no mistake, every single industry on earth will be disrupted over the next five to 15 years. Every single last one of them, okay? So I'm looking at these ones, at these technologies, sensors, artificial intelligence, solar, batteries, and so on. Um, and in different combinations, they can disrupt different industries. Um, so let me give you this example, sensors. Um, we don't think much about sensors, but you have a couple dozen sensors in your iPhone or your Android. Uh, and sensors have improved in cost by about a thousand times since 2007. A thousand times. Now, a 10X usually means a disruption but a thousand times is incredible in just seven years. And also the number of sensors that are produced every year went up in 2007 from 10 million to 10 billion in 2014. And if it keeps improving at that rate, essentially what we're looking at is 10 trillion sensors per year before 2025. 10 trillion sensors, think about it. 7 billion people on Earth, 10 trillion sensors per year, that's 1,300 sensors per person. What on Earth are we gonna do with that? Think about it, but you have to if you wanna think about disruption. Um, so one conclusion is, of course, everything will have embedded sensors. Shirts, you know, uh, Fitbits, uh, every, everyone will have embedded sensors too. Um, so let me talk a little bit about product innovation. Sports, for instance, who thought about sensors in sports? Well, there are companies that are doing these sensor-based little devices that can help you with your swing. 
right? Baseball, tennis, cricket. If you swing, well, with sports, um, you know, essentially it, it helps you uh, with your swing, right? Uh, basically improve it for a couple hundred dollars. Um, basketball, it, it, with sensors, essentially it can show you the arc, the push, you know, how hard or whatever so that you can improve it. That's a couple hundred dollars. Wouldn't you, if you play basketball, want to pay that to improve your game? I would. Uh, transportation. So this is what an autonomous car sees when it uses a sensor called LiDAR. So LiDAR is the essential sensor for autonomous vehicles. It's essentially, it emits laser pulses about a million per second that bounce back 100 meters to 100 meters. They bounce back like a radar and essentially it uses a supercomputer in the trunk to uh, generate a picture like this so that it can self-drive. So in 2012, a LiDAR was about $70,000. Um, and what did the experts say in 2012? Autonomous vehicles, not gonna happen, right? $70,000, too expensive. Okay, so next year, it was 10,000. The following year, 1,000. Boom, right? Not only that, last year, Silicon Valley Company announced a $250 LiDAR. Solid state, so it lasts longer and it's about yay big. So it doesn't have to be on the top of the car, ugly, but you can put it anywhere. 250. Even if you use three, four of them, it's only a thousand bucks incremental cost. Not only that, they also announced a $90 LiDAR, the size of a postage stamp, fits in your iPhone. What are you going to do with it? I don't know, but you know, the, the <laughs> go figure, right? That, 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 that's opportunity for you. Um, now, all of these sensors are going to create big data because they're going to be emitting data 24-7 every second of every you know, day uh, and so on. And what we expect is that over the next 10 years or so, uh, the amount of data generated by sensors and, and us is gonna go up by about 10,000 times. 10,000, you think we have big data now? Just you wait, 10,000 times. We're gonna look back at today as the good old days of little data. Uh, this is gonna be so much data. Um, and the interesting thing about this for the entrepreneurs in the crowd is that data about things may actually be more valuable than the things themselves. So wrap your head around that. I mean, think about Uber. How many cars do they own? Zero, right? They have data, a lot of data about transportation, a lot of data about you and me, and a lot of data about the drivers. It's a data company, essentially, right? So data about transportation may be more important than transportation itself. Artificial intelligence has made more progress over the last few years than over the previous three decades. Uh, and just to give you an example, this was the world's uh, fastest supercomputer, the first one teraflops, trillion floating point operations per second. In the year 2000, it was the size of this room, and it cost $50 million. One teraflops, $50 million. Now, last year's version of the NVIDIA GPU was a two teraflops uh, computer for 50 bucks. <laughs> One million time improvement since the year 2000. And that's just the hardware. It doesn't include the improvement in software, which has been more insane. Um, and they just announced that 20 teraflops computer, uh, that essentially is what we're gonna need to power uh, self-driving cars. 20 teraflops in just two years, 10X. And they also say, that uh, essentially they're gonna improve by about 1,000 times by 2025. So essentially anything AI is gonna improve by 1,000 times, not including software, from here to 2025. Um, so what's gonna improve? Well, look, um, you know, today a computer can essentially read and map out and essentially give doctors a uh, conclusion uh, in minutes that it would take them weeks to process doctors, right? 
minutes, if they could possibly do that. Um, and anything, I mean, the, the, what you need to remember also is that the hardware, the sensors, the GPU, the AI that works for a self-driving car can work for a robot, can also work for a ship, can also work for a plane. It's portable. Uh, all of this technology is portable, just like computing is portable. So, you know, robots are going to improve by about a thousand times, right, if this hardware uh, improves by a thousand times. So robots already can do surgery, uh, stitching better than the best doctor on earth. Already. Sub-millimeter precision. Already. And they're going to get a thousand times better you know, by 2025. And robots can actually do experimental prostate surgery inside an MRI machine. Try that with a human doctor. <laughs> inside an MRI machine. <laughs> Um, and uh, so another technology, 3D printing. So interesting. Can anyone see where the statue is? Where is the jewelry? Anyone? There. It's smaller than a human hair. That's how little you can print with a 3D printer. Um, but that's not as interesting as this. The whole uh, dental brace industry was disrupted by a company called Invisalign. Uh, does anyone remember metal braces? Well, you know, they don't exist anymore because they're all 3D printed. In two years, that industry was wiped out with 3D printers by this company in San Jose. But you can 3D print basically anything, any part of you. Okay, and that industry is improving also exponentially. You can 3D print a car. And in fact, this car is already out there driving. Of course, electric car, um, because I'll tell you why, but uh, you can already 3D print an electric car. Drones are also improving exponentially. Um, so, you know, the Swiss postal system is already delivering letters with drones. In New Zealand, they're already delivering pizza with drones, right? And they're improving really, really quickly. Um, this is the first drone that can self not drive, but fly uh, a human, a human being. Can fly a human being about a half an hour. You just say, take me here, and it, it's $100,000. But if you look at the cost curve, uh, essentially you can map out when this is going to be affordable. Um, and convergence, convergence. Remember technology convergence, right? So imagine a van, self-driving van, Imagine UPS or FedEx and whatnot with drones. So it doesn't stop and double park and triple park uh, to deliver, but you have a number of a dozen, two dozen drones that come in and out of the truck that is self-driving. Okay, so think about what this disruption would do to logistics. And a lot of these pieces are already there. It's just a matter of when, not if. Now, business model innovation is every bit as disruptive as technology innovation, if not more. So if you think of Uber, Uber is actually a business model disruption. Why? Because they took advantage of the cloud, they took advantage of the smartphone, and then essentially they created technology, a new, not a new business model, they're a broker between two markets. So it's an old business model that they adapted to a new, basically, te technology convergence. And if you look at Uber um, and think that they were started 2009, eight years ago, and today they have bookings that are higher than the whole US taxi industry today. I mean, if anyone tells you that you can't have a disruption in transportation in 10 years, well, look at Uber. Already they have you know, bookings higher than the whole US taxi industry. And in New York City, there are 500,000 rides, not just with Uber, but with all ride sharing companies per day. 500,000 per day. And that's doubling every year, okay? Um, Airbnb is also a business model innovation. So again, they took advantage of uh, the cloud and, 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 and smartphones and so on. And they created a whole new industry, and they're starting the process of disrupting hotels. So 
always remember business model innovation. Uh, and business model innovation is enabled by technology convergence. And so we've looked at a few of these pieces um, and how can we accelerate disruptions? Because we can. Openness, that's what is uh, accelerating disruptions. So if you look at some of these robots, some of these robots like Baxter and, 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 and so on, um, use an open operating system. Anyone in this room can go and download uh, basically robot operating system for free and use it in a robot. And anyone anywhere on earth today can essentially use a free operating system and develop their own robot. How disruptive is that? So that tends to accelerate openness, tends to accelerate disruptions. Um, and look at you know, APIs, APIs, uh, programming interface. Essentially, you have all of Amazon's infrastructure available to you. You have robots, you have a whole host of basically companies who open up their technology so that anyone anywhere can start a company uh, without much investment. So the cost of entrepreneurship, the cost of getting into a business is going down dramatically because of this openness. Um, and of course, open research. So batteries are improving, you know, are accelerating the improvement. And one of the reasons is that uh, a lot of the research is open. And so there's the, the, the you know, battery research open. Uh, anyone, anywhere who wants to participate is helping everyone everywhere. So this openness accelerates disruptions. Um, so talking about battery, can we anticipate disruptions? So how can we use this framework to anticipate disruptions? So let's do it. Um, let's talk about transportation. Transportation, 2020, 2030. So I just published a uh, research report called The Disruption of Transportation 2020, 2030. And this is how it's gonna happen using this framework. So electric vehicles, are they disruptive? Well, many reasons why they are. On a per mile basis, EVs are 10 times cheaper to charge than combustion engine automobiles. 10 times. Every time we have a 10X, we have a potentially disruptive uh, opportunity. Um, an electric vehicle has 100 times fewer parts than a combustion engine automobile. 100 times. Your car has 2,000 moving parts, an EV, about 20. This means that maintenance for EVs are essentially zero. I mean, 10 times at least cheaper than maintaining a combustion engine. The lifetime, this is something that a whole lot of people don't see because we only drive about 10,000 miles per year, but an EV can last 500,000 miles. Unless we drive a car for 50 years, which nobody does, th th this is not a useful thing, right? But I'll tell you why it's useful when you do the numbers for disruption. Now, if all you look at uh, is a, it's an EV as a one-to-one -one substitute, then you can map out when it's going to disrupt the internal combustion engine automobile. So we're at the point now that an EV with 320 kilometer range is 35 to 40,000 US dollars. And we can map out uh, how soon it's going to essentially disrupt the whole ICE uh, car industry. But that's not it. I mean, autonomous vehicles are going to be an enabler of the, the big disruption. And autonomous vehicles are not that far away. I mean, fly out to Singapore and you can take already a taxi that's autonomous today. Um, and Pittsburgh, you can also do the same thing with Uber. So Uber has a fleet of self-driving cars uh, that they're testing in, in Pittsburgh. And there are now 30 plus corporations, large corporations investing billions of dollars uh, in making autonomous technology. Why? Well, here's one. Tesla says that by the end of this year, every Tesla will be able to drive from a parking lot in San Francisco to a parking lot in New York without being touched by a human by the end of this year. That's level three. Level five is when you don't need a steering wheel or a pedal. 
level five. That's like the ultimate of the ultimate, right? And they say that within two years, by 2019, they're going to have level five autonomous vehicle. Now, think about this. Um, autonomous vehicles are computers on wheels. That's what they are. They have a computer, they have an operating system, just like a personal computer, just like a smartphone. So the first one to get that operating system going is going to be a big winner. See? So we have dozens of corporations who want to be the first. Because in operating systems, there's going to be just one, two, three that make it. That's it. Um, so what is the disruptive impact of autonomous vehicles? Well, let's do this. Let's call it transport as a service. And oh, one thing that I forgot. We pay $10,000 a year uh, for cars, and yet we only use them 4% of the time. 4%, what a waste. 4% asset utilization is a disruption waiting to happen. And how is that going to happen? Let's converge electric vehicles, autonomous, and uh, the business model of ride sharing. And so what happens is that driving time goes from 4% of the time to 40%. So you have autonomous vehicles riding around, taking you to work, and basically taking then somebody from work to the supermarket, and then taking somebody from there to home 40% of the time instead of 4% of the time. That means 10 times more utilization. That means what? They can drive 100,000 miles per year instead of 10,000 miles per year. So they're really driving all the time. And this is where the electric vehicle which lasts 500,000 miles, it's useful as opposed to 140,000 miles. So if you depreciate the, that cost over 500,000 miles on a per mile basis, which is disruptions may bring new metrics. So the new metric of the disruption of transport is cost per mile. Uh, this is what you get. TAS, transport as a service, Assume that they're approved 2021. The day that autonomous vehicles are approved, autonomous electric on demand, TAS, will be up to 10 times cheaper than buying a new car. So if you're going to buy a new car, 2021, your decision is going to be, do I spend $10,000 a year over the next five years, or do I spend $1,000 a year over the next five years? No brainer. Every time in history that there's been a 10x difference uh, between similar products and services in cost, there's been a disruption. Every single time period, right? So assuming that this happens 2021, it's going to be a 10-year disruption. Essentially, you can map it out as an S-curve. Um, and this is what's going to happen. By the end of, by 2030, 95% of passenger miles will be autonomous electric miles. 95% from 2021 to 2030. Boom. That's a disruption. That's a disruption of two things. Of the individual ownership business model and of the internal combustion engine automobile. And that's going to happen very quickly. And what else is going to happen? So because we have cars being used 10 times as much, we're going to need fewer cars. So we're going to need 80% fewer cars. The fleet is going to shrink. So 80% fewer cars. What happens with parking lots? Empty, especially in the high real estate areas, gone. Parking lots, 80 to 90% of parking space, gone, right? But the U.S., the vehicle fleet shrinks by 80%, which means, what does it mean for the auto industry? If you're an auto manufacturer, here's what it means. The demand for new cars is going to shrink by 70%. So the size of the industry is going to go down by 70% at the same time that we have hundreds of electric vehicle companies coming into the space. So if you're an auto manufacturer, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly, right? Um, what about the oil industry? Here's what's going to happen. Um, oil demand is going to peak 2020 at $100 million per barrel. 
because it's all going to be electric starting 2021. And it's going to go down to about 70 million barrels by 2030. So it's going to go down 30%. But there's something interesting about the oil industry. When you go down to uh, essentially 70 million barrels, the price is going to collapse immediately. So the price of oil, because of the uh, elasticity of both uh, demand and supply of, of oil, because you only need about 2 million barrels over supply in order for prices to crash, that price crash is going to happen as soon as 2021 or 2022, which means that the new equilibrium cost for oil is going to be $25. If you can't compete at 25 as soon as 2021 or two, essentially you have a stranded asset. So anything that is shale, uh, sands, or deep water oil that can't compete at 25, gone, stranded forever, because it's not coming back, right? Um, so let me wrap it up. Um, essentially, this is how disruptions happen, okay? We have a combination of technology cost curves and business model innovation and openness and uh, product innovation. And this is where we are in 2017. This is the point where we have the lone car in a sea of horses. Uh, and disruptions happen very quickly. And this is the age of disruptions. When you combine these technologies that I showed you in different ways and with different business models, essentially every single industry is going to be disrupted uh, over the next 5 to 15 years. You name the industry is going to be disrupted when you combine these technologies uh, in different ways. Uh, and these are you know, the technologies that I am uh, tracking. And anything is possible. I mean, these technologies and new business models are you know, becoming available with any convergence and every convergence of these technologies. And you have to track it in your industry. Otherwise, you know, disrupt or be disrupted. That's the way that it's going to be. But everything is going to be possible. Essentially, this is the edge of the possible. Um, and hopefully, when you use this uh, technology disruption framework, it, it can help you put together disruptive products. And you know, if you're an incumbent, help you avoid being disrupted. Um, and the edge of the possible is not in the future. Um, you know, the age of disruption is not in the future. It is right now. Thank you. Okay, so we've been really good and we've left lots of time for questions. Um, so uh, as I uh, said over lunch, this is the sort of presentation where you either run screaming from the room um, in uh, either delight or fear. Um, or as, uh, if you're a New Zealander, you're really excited about having uh, sheep delivered by drones to your doorstep. <laughs> Um, so I'll now um, you know, sit here next to Tony um, in this very privileged place. Um, shall I kick off a question to start with? As you wish. Um, uh, what about brand? Um, you know, we've got all these companies around the world with yes. huge brand value sitting on their balance sheets. What does all this mean for brand value? Yeah, so transport as a service means that their relationship with the customer uh, is not going to be with the car. Uh, it's going to be when we get an Uber today. Essentially, we're getting an Uber. Uh, we don't care what's behind it. In a data center, I mean, our relationship is with Facebook or Google, not with the computer that's in that data center. Uh, so if our companies don't get in front of this transport as a service, and they get in your app and compete with the Ubers, essentially that brand will be gone. They'll be commoditized, in other words. OK. OK. We, um, I think we've got some mics roving around. They're not coming to you by drone yet. Mm. Hi, uh, thanks for your excellent presentation. I'm Thank interested you. in the timing of, say, driverless cars. Obviously, yes. we, we know now the technology's here and proven. But I guess the difference, say, with mobile phones in terms of adoption is you've got a strong regulatory legal aspect on cars going around rather than mobile phones. Yes. 
um, and I've got a bet with a friend on how long it's going to take me to be able to get in the driverless car in Sydney. Mm -hmm. What do you think the timing will be given that there's another kind of angle from a regulatory and even an ethical point of view you know, right. from driverless technology? Right. Um, so from an ethical point of view, we're going to save 1.2 million lives every year um, when we have driverless cars. We're going to be able to uh, essentially offer cheap, convenient transportation to essentially, you know, the elderly, the disabled, the very young, and so on. Uh, so from an ethical, the disabled, from an ethical perspective, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, you know, it's a big, huge plus for society. Um, so from a technology point of view, you have dozens and dozens of companies uh, basically moving into the space. And again, if you think of autonomous vehicles are as computers on wheels, uh, you need one operating system to work. One, right? You need iOS, you need an Android. Once one works, then essentially it's basically gonna happen. Um, and then it's gonna depend on which country or somewhere or which state in the US uh, that essentially approves it. And they're gonna approve it because it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because no, <laughs> economy, so TAS, transport as a service, is going to be 10 times cheaper than essentially the internal combustion engine individually owned economy that we have today. 10 times cheaper. The countries that don't go to AEVs, autonomous electric vehicles, essentially cannot compete. You know, they're going to have an infrastructure that is 10 times more expensive and it's going to be, you know, like competing against cars with horses. It's, it's that same thing, right? Um, so countries that want to compete are going to have to approve it once anybody anywhere approves uh, AEV. So you're going to see this uh, competitive policy making, which is already happening. So last week, Colorado announced that they're, uh, you know, approving self-driving cars, and every week you're seeing new countries and new states and so on that are, are approving pilots. Um, and when the first operating system is going to happen, Tesla says 2019. In my model, I say 2021, but the, 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 this model works. Basically, it's a 10-year disruption, no matter when it starts. So the first time that we have level five uh, autonomous vehicles and it's approved, it's a 10-year disruption. And if it's 2019, it's gonna basically by 20, uh, 28 or nine, you're gonna have 95% of miles being autonomous electric vehicles. Hi, thank you Hi. very much. It was a little scary. Um, uh, I suppose I'm looking at um, infrastructure. So we know that um, property, and we love property here in Australia, um, has been driven a lot by your proximity to the city. Um, and you look at Palm Beach prices versus Central Coast, or you look at the money the government's spending on infrastructure at the moment. Mm. Um, it feels like that, that property and infrastructure is a big disruptor coming as a result, or sorry, something that's going to be disrupted as a result of this. Have you got any thoughts or work you've done on that? Yes. So you're going to have 80 or 90% of parking space vacant. Um, so I've done the numbers for Los Angeles, for instance, and the vacant parking space in LA uh, will be able to fit three cities the size of San Francisco. Uh, check that out, right? So, but it's a big opportunity. Essentially, for the first time in you know, a century, if not more, uh, as a society, we're going to have the opportunity to redesign our cities to be what we want our cities to be. Do we want that space to be green parks? Do we want that space to be new businesses? Do we want that space or what percent uh, affordable housing and so on and, for, and so forth, right? So it's going to be an opportunity for us to redesign our cities for people, not for cars. And, and I see that as a huge opportunity. Uh, yeah. So, so picking up that, um, what do you think governments can do to get the best out of disruption? Um, get ahead of it. So um, that's a great question. First of all, uh, ignore the mainstream analysts, um, you know, who tell you that things are just going to change 5%, 10% per year and, and so on, and the future is going to be just like the past. It won't. Uh, you know, disruptions don't happen linearly. They happen, you know, in S-curves and, and dramatically. Um, so essentially, you need to do the numbers on the disruption, uh, on every disruption, telecom, healthcare, food. Uh, food's going to be disrupted in a big way. Energy's going to be disrupted in a big way. And get in front of it. And do the numbers, um, you know, mitigate the downside 
Uh, so for transportation, for instance, um, drivers, truck drivers, they're going to lose their job. So we're going to have 5 million folks who are going to lose their job. Uh, on the other hand, we're going to have an extra, just U.S. numbers, trillion dollars in consumer spending that consumers are going to uh, essentially save by not owning a car and using transportation as a service. A trillion dollars and then an additional trillion dollars um, because we're not going to waste time driving. So nurses will be able to, well, nurse, and lawyers will be able to lawyer and consultants to consult and, and so on while not driving. So essentially that's going to generate an extra trillion dollar of productivity. So just in transportation, we'll be able to generate an additional $2 trillion, um, which is 10, 15% addition to GDP by going to transport as a service. And at the same time, we're going to have to mitigate the job losses. So governments will need to look at the pluses and the minuses, mitigate the minuses, and take advantage of the pluses, but do it with data, right? Do it with evidence uh, rather than just, you know, old-fashioned politicking and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but get in front of it. I mean, do the numbers uh, because we do need to mitigate the losses while taking advantage of the upside. <coughs> Doesn't work. We'll try this. Oh, try this. Um, you know, there seems to be an overarching theme. If you go back to where you showed that dramatic increase in the time, in the rate and pace of disruption, it was really about the point that we went from going to CapEx to OpEx. If you think about, you know, all the guys, Amazon, Google, and such, when they had access to a cloud and created the market, suddenly instead of having to shell out a billion dollars of, you know, CapEx in order to set up a business, you basically just logged on and set up your business, especially if it's just uh, IT-based, almost overnight. I guess the question is, are there such overarching themes? Because one of the things about technology that worries me is there's this mindless thing that it goes on forever. And as we've all seen, you know, we've seen technologies just run into walls. Uh, silicon technology, which you mentioned, died uh, the early version in about 2003 is when Moore's Law sort of ended. Since then, there's been no progress in the speed of a thread in a computer. And in about 2020 or so, it dies altogether because silicon goes quantum mechanical, which fancy way of saying it doesn't work anymore. So the question is, that's the opposite sort of disruptor. And it's not to say acceleration stops. It doesn't. They'll find other ways around it. They always have. But I am curious, are there higher level themes than these sort of discrete things? Because what we've seen in the growth of businesses in the IT space has really been around the ability to stand up a business like Facebook in the span of literally a month versus 10 years. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> like I yeah. said, is there an overarching theme in this dramatic acceleration you're seeing, such as in the IT space, you could push it back to say, look, here we had the availability <clears throat> of standing up IT literally, but as a service. I mean, is that your sort of high level view of all of these as an example? Is there one overarching theme you're seeing where you really just believe it's a wide diversity of things? Um, so, so I'm going to disagree with, with you on, on, on a couple of things. One is that um, yes, CPUs are, um, so the Intel, the personal computers and so on, they're slowing down, but not GPUs. So GPUs is basically are used for artificial intelligence. And if you talk to NVIDIA, they're saying that they're improving by about 50% per year. Um, so the architecture may change, but essentially the improvement rate is actually accelerating for GPUs, it's even higher than it used to be for, um, for uh, CPUs. If you look at the history of information from about 1890, uh, it's been pretty much an accelerating rate uh, for 130 years. And we've had different technologies that substitute for the, for the last one. And I've heard for 30 years that it's the end of Moore's Law. And guess what? It hasn't ended. And it won't end anytime soon. It's just going to be a different technology. Um, you know, it may, which one it's going to be for, for the foreseeable future, GPUs, and then who knows, right? Uh, um, so, so, so I'm going to disagree with you uh, on that point. And on the other point of whether it's CapEx or OpEx, it's just a matter of who does the CapEx. CapEx is investment. So as users, as consumers of transportation, we're not going to have to buy a car. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody is not going to buy a car. Somebody is going to buy a car, just that like somebody buys an airplane and we use it as a service. Just like uh, essentially, and there's an industry that buys airplanes, leases airplanes, and 
essentially we're just users as a service. And so essentially the, the, the auto industry is going in that direction where we as users use it as a service, but somebody else takes on the CapEx and it's gonna be the Fords and the Ubers and so on and so forth. So we benefit because they have you know, scale, they have, they have better capital, they have better manufacturing they have, and so on and so forth. And so as users, we benefit tremendously. Um, you know, we're gonna save up to 90% of the cost of transportation because of that, because we're gonna transfer that to somebody else and efficiencies are going to go up. So in this uh, internet of everything, mm. how worried should I be about cyber risk? Um, I mean, you should be worried today about, you know, nuclear power plants being, you know, uh, hacked. And in fact, you know, we know that they can be hacked because the U.S. government has done it, right? So, you know, should you be worried about one car being hacked? Well, I'm worried about nuclear plants being hacked. Um, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to wrap up, sadly, because no doubt we could talk for another hour with Tony. The good thing is that we now all have lots of content for our next dinner party or barbecues and many things that will rack our brains in the middle of the night. Thank you again to uh, Norton Rose Fulbright, Simon, for sponsoring this uh, talk by Tony, and thanks for coming here to Sydney again Thank to join you. us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.